Amen. It's a message. The message that we have this morning is one that I really feel that God has laid on my heart. Uh, I sat before the Lord, as I always do whenever I get ready to deliver a message. And I have several messages that I believe that God wants me to deliver. Um, but it wasn't the word for this hour, for this group in this moment. But it is a message that I believe that the body of Christ in general needs to hear. Amen. So the first scripture that I want you guys to just go to and hold on to for a moment is going to be coming out of Exodus chapter 30. Amen. Are you trying to do, let's see. We're going to be coming out of Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16. We're just working with the, um, the Zoom right now to get it into just the speaker's view. So this is a, a new platform that we're trying for this this morning. So if y'all would just bear with us, just hold on just a little while longer. So are you trying to get it to the presenter's view or are you just trying to get it to record? I'm just trying to, well, I don't know if it's recording all of what we're seeing right now. I will edit all this out. So y'all just bear with us. I'm sorry. Let's see if it was just allowed to record. Okay. 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 So the first scripture that I want you guys to go to and put a uh, pen in for right now is going to be Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16. But the title of the message this morning is called The Silver Thread of Redemption. It's a message that's actually been in my spirit probably since the inception of the ministry that God laid on my heart to begin, which is Commission Ministries. And it came out of um, the inception of the ministry when I was choosing church colors. I know that seems kind of arbitrary, but it's like I feel like there was meaning behind everything that I was doing. And the colors of our ministry are blue, silver, and white. And as I began to research all of the meanings behind the different colors, because God doesn't do anything haphazardly, I realized that there was a special meaning behind the color silver. And as I was praying and asking God to give me a word for this morning, he took me to this message that has been in my spirit probably since 2008, but I don't think I've ever actually preached the message. It is on our website, it is in our church documents, but it's not a message that I've ever preached. And so, it's one that God has been communicating since time immemorial, the silver thread of redemption. The message this morning is about the message of reconciliation, restoration, and healing. And in this season, Father Yah, God is sending out a clarion call. He's sending out a clarion call. Clarion means loud, clear, like the sound of a trumpet, a sound that is high and shrill. So he's sending out a clarion call to return. The message is not new, for there's been a silver thread of redemption that has been woven throughout human history in God's dealings with mankind. And while the silver thread has been woven throughout the Old and the New Testament, present in the law and in the grace, it is certainly not new. But there is an urgency for his ambassadors to sound the trumpet and call people back because we have entered into a season of judgment. Bless you, Lord God. And we are now experiencing what I believe to be the birth pain spoken of Yeshua HaMashiach. 
in the Olivet Discourse that is found in Matthew 24. And so while we are still, though, in this period of grace, even though we have entered into the period of the birth pains that Jesus spoke about, we are still in a period of grace. Our job is to proclaim this message and to reveal the silver thread of redemptions to our sons, to our daughters, to our fathers, to our mothers, to our brothers, our sisters, our friends, our neighbors. The word is telling us that we are to be his ambassadors and to sound the clarion call to return. Zechariah 1 and 3, it says, therefore say to the people, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. These are the instructions that God was given to Zechariah to tell the people, if you return to me, then I will return to you. That message is a message that was from the foundation of the earth. It was going all through the Old Testament during the time of the law, and it is going all the way into the New Testament. And now that message has become more urgent now than it has ever been, because we are in a season of judgment. We can see Yahuwah as the great heavenly exchequer. And I don't know, I'm a nerd, so some of y'all may watch DS9. There was this, uh, this character or this, this idea of the great heavenly exchequer. But God is the great heavenly exchequer. So what is an exchequer? Because I'm going to be using this term throughout the message. An exchequer or the exchequer is the government office responsible for collecting revenue and making payments on behalf of the sovereign, auditing official accounts, and trying legal cases relating to revenue. So the exchequer office is an office responsible for collecting revenue, making payments on behalf of the sovereign, auditing official accounts, and trying legal cases relating to revenue. So I'm going to be giving this uh, metaphor of God as the great heavenly exchequer. He has been weaving the silver thread of redemption throughout time, and he did it when he established the law with the people through Moshe or Moses and the establishment of the temple worship. And it's where we pick up in our scripture in, chapter, in Exodus chapter 30, starting at verse 11. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, whenever you take a census of the people of Israel, each man who is counted must pay a ransom for himself to the Lord. Then no plague will strike the people as you count them. Each person who is counted must give a small piece of silver as a sacred offering to the Lord. This payment is a half a shekel based on the sanctuary shekel, which equals 20 geras. All who have reached their 20th birthday must give this sacred offering to the Lord. When this offering is given to the Lord to purify yourselves, you must, making you right with him, the rich must not give more than the specified amount and the poor must not give less. Receive this ransom money from the Israelites and use it for the care of the tabernacle. It will bring the Israelites to the Lord's attention and it will purify their lives. Amen? Amen? So before we can continue talking about the silver thread of redemption, we have to understand what God is doing right here in Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16. Also, I want you to understand that I don't think it's lost on God or in the spirit that God brought me to this particular passage as we began talking about the silver thread of redemption. It's a scripture that God gave me to help me understand what the silver thread was way back in 2008. But as I revisited this, I haven't looked at this in years. So I believe God that is really moving. This is a prophetic word that he's speaking right now in this season, in this hour. And it's not lost on me. And I don't believe that it's lost on God right now that we are also in a census year. Nitin is coming to hear the message. Amen. I don't believe that it's lost on us or God that we are in a census year and we are also in the middle of a plague. All right, come on, somebody. Bless you, Lord God. So I believe that God is speaking directly to us in this scripture. So we have to understand what God was doing here and what he was saying. Amen? Those who have ears to hear right now, let them hear. 
We see God telling Moses to instruct them that they must pay a ransom or give a small piece of silver as a sacred offering to the Lord. So no plague will strike them when they are counted to make them right with the Lord. Most people understand a plague as a pestilence or a disease. We covered this when we talked about um, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse and we were speaking and, and teaching out of Zechariah and Revelation chapter six. And we, we gave this definition and it's one that can be applied in Matthew chapter 24 and Revelation chapter six. A pestilence is a uh, contagious or infectious epidemic that is virulent and devastating, especially the blue bonnet plague. That was the definition that they gave. Now we can include the COVID-19, the coronavirus. So this one though, is an understanding of a plague that's seen in Matthew chapter 24 and six, this definition that we have already been working with. However, this does not fully explain what a plague is and what the word means or why it happens. Because what God told Moses is that they must pay a ransom so that no plague will come upon them. So what are we talking about here? If we're not specifically talking about a plague as we know it, we have to understand what God was saying to them in this word. Well, first of all, why does a plague happen? A plague happens or it occurs as a judgment on sin. So that is the why. So when God sends a plague, please understand and know that it is a judgment on sin. But the word plague here means a blow, a strike, as in to strike a blow or to hit. It also means to cause, to inflict something unpleasant or painful to be suffered by someone or something. It also means a stumbling, as in the foot strikes a stone, which causes it to stumble. So when we insert this meaning and this understanding of what a plague is in the Hebraic sense of the word, other than it just being about a virus or about some other major occurrence, we understand that a plague is, it occurs because of a judgment of sin and a plague is, or it means to strike, to hit, to blow, or it means to cause, to stumble, as in, a stone which causes to stumble. And we know that Jesus is the stone which causes people to stumble. So therefore Pharaoh and Egypt were hit or struck with a judgment from God that was manifested through boils, frogs, hail, locusts, and more. So that's the how. So when we see Pharaoh and Egypt being struck with plagues, they were hit with a judgment and the manifestation of it was the things that we saw them experience. That is the how. Proverbs 19 and 29 affirms that a judgment is a strike because it says judgments are prepared for scoffers and beatings for the backs of fools. And if we take that literally, we think that we literally are saying that fools are to be beat. That's not what we are saying. That's not what the scripture is saying. It's saying that people who scoff at God, who scoff at repentance, who scoff at heavenly things and God's presence and his sovereignty over the earth, people who don't acknowledge God in their lives or people who are subject to be struck with a judgment. Amen? So since we know that a plague is a judgment or a hit or strike for sin, we now understand that the method for judgment can vary as we have seen throughout the scripture, such as a drought or a disease. So when we see a plague, we are seeing the manifestation of it, but we're not truly understanding that it is a hit or a strike or a judgment for sin. The methods may vary, but the reason why is always still the same. The method which God chooses to execute judgment is not as important as why he does. However, we must be careful to not draw a direct parallel to biblical plagues and the current plague we are seeing today because both believers and non-believers are experiencing this current pestilence. Amen? So when God instructed Moses to have the people pay a ransom with a silver coin to avoid a plague, it was ultimately to avoid judgment for their sins. I'm going to say that again. When God instructed Moses 
to have the people pay a silver coin or a ransom for their sin. It was to avoid judgment for their sins. It was to purify them, to make them right with him. Amen? It was to make them right with him. So then silver in scripture is associated with the price of redemption. It is associated with atonement and reconciliation. Law, Yah laid the silver thread of redemption through the tapestry of his covenants, first through Moses, then through Jesus. First Peter 1 and 18, for you know that God paid a ransom God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but he has now revealed him to you in these last days. God began to weave the silver thread before the world began. Because it says God chose him long before the world began. So the silver cord that he's been running for our redemption, for our reconciliation, began before the foundation of the world. Silver is a reminder of the high price that was paid for our sins. Silver is a reminder of the free gift of salvation and the obligation to serve or to be slaves to the one who paid the price. Silver was costly for everyone who had to pay, but the price Jesus paid was far greater. The tapestry is the word of God, which displays the picture of the coming kingdom. And in it, God has weaved in and out his plan for salvation, reconciliation, and redemption. Throughout the text, we can and see the threads of God visibly repeating the same message over and over again. Come back to me. Come back to me. We can see it in the prophet Isaiah's words. Isaiah 53, 5 through 6. But he was wounded. He was struck for our transgressions, for our sins. He was wounded. He was struck for our sins. He was bruised, receiving the strike and getting the bruise for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace, the judgment, the chastisement, the hit, the strike for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, a stripes, the word plague also means stripes. By his stripes, we are healed. Bless you today, Lord God. So for all of you who are suffering in your bodies right now, Jesus is the one that took the strike. He's the one that took the stripes. He was the one that's wounded in your body, in your mind, for the depression that you are experiencing right now. He is the one that took the strike for the things that we are going through in our bodies and in our minds. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in the law of Moses during his time, the people had to come up with a piece of silver, regardless of whether you were rich or poor, regardless of whether you had the money or not, you had to come up with a piece of silver, a silver coin in order to be uh, uh, removed from the penalty of sin so that no plague, no strike or judgment for your sins would come upon you. But when Jesus came, Isaiah prophesied that he would be the one to pay the price. He would be the one that will receive the strike or the judgment for the, fa the fact that we've all fallen short, for the fact that we have all sinned. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes we are all healed. Yahuwah, the great heavenly exchequer, exchequer sent his son to pay the price. And because of him, I can sing a, sing a refrain from the hymn saying, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he has washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all. Romans 6, 20 through 23. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obliga obligation to do right. Did, did y'all catch that? 
when you were slaves to sin. So if you are a believer and you've been a believer for a while, or even the very day that you became a believer, you are no longer a slave to sin. So why are we going around saying, I can't do this and I can't help it. And then I feel like I'm going to wind up doing this and I'm going to do that. And that if I curse you out, it's your fault. You're going to make me cheat on you. Whatever it is, uh, 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 you know, I had to tell a white lie. No, 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 no. The day that you become bought back to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, you are no, no longer under the obligation to sin. So stop saying that. We need to stop saying that. Bless you, Lord God. Where am I at? Romans 6, 23, 22, 23. See, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get ahead of myself. It says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. You didn't have any obligation to do right when you were a sinner before you got saved. And then, but what was the result? It tells you something, then it asks you a question. What was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do. But I guess that's the question. Are you ashamed of the things you used to do? Or are you still doing them and you making an excuse for the fact that you're still doing these things? But it says, you were ashamed of the things you used to do. God knows I am. Some things I'll take to my grave. I will never tell another living soul some things I've done because I'm ashamed. I ain't going to tell it. I ain't going to never say a mumbling word about it. Mm. Things that end in eternal doom. But you are now free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages, the wages, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we start reviewing these scriptures about being struck about the wages of sin, about the free gift of salvation. We understand that God, the Father, is the great heavenly exchequer in heaven that is weaving the silver thread of redemption throughout time. Bless you, Lord God. Second Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task, believers, brothers and sisters, he has now given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Now, hold on. I don't know if y'all caught that or not, but that's a bad God right there. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world back to himself. That's, that's, huh. I don't know, if, I don't know if y'all caught that, but that makes me want to shout right there. When I think about God the Father being in Christ the Son, reconciling people back to himself. So I don't know if y'all might have missed that. But anyway, no longer counting. Do y'all hear this? Counting like counting money. He was no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. And this was one of the first Bible studies that I ever did when I launched out on my own in ministry about being an ambassador. So it is no mistake I believe that we are revisiting this because this is the season and the word for the hour right now. We are Christ's ambassadors. Verse 20, and God is making his appeal. He's making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering Come on, for our sins, so that we could be made right through Christ. Remember Exodus chapter 30? They paid the silver coin so that no plague or strike of judgment for their sins will be count counted against them. They paid the silver coin so that they could be made right with God. 
but now God made Christ who never sinned, never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. What the silver coin used to do was make us right with God. Christ has now paid that price once and for all. He has reconciled us. And that, that's all wonderful and great and all, but what does it mean to be reconciled? And what does it have to do with the silver thread of redemption that God has been weaving throughout time? Well, first of all, we have to understand what reconciliation is. It comes from the Greek word katalazo, and it was originally used for the exchange of coins. How awesome is it of God to have communicated that, that reconciliation was originally a word used for the exchange of coins, properly to exchange, especially of money, hence of persons, to change from enmity to friendship, to reconcile. There's an exchange happening. So when we talk about reconciliation, we're talking about an exchange. But in accounting, the word reconciliation is the process of ensuring that two sets of records are in agreement. Reconciliation is used to ensure that the money leaving an account matches the actual money spent. This is done by making sure the balances match at the end of a particular accounting period. I don't know if y'all are catching that. Reconciliation is the process of ensuring that two sets of records are in agreement. That is why it is written in Colossians 2 and 14. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. He imputed Christ's righteousness into our account. He removed our charges and he gave us his record. Christ's record was that of a sinless, spotless lamb. Our record are, is a record of sin and shame and guilt. So in order for us to be reconciled in accounting, when you do your checkbook, you have to reconcile. You have to reconcile your account to make sure that what the account is saying online is matching up. Well, and I don't nobody, don't nobody do checkbooks no more. And some people do. Some people do, but not a lot of people do. Don't nobody really do that no more. We just check our account every day. But back in the day, before online accounting, and you would get you would wait every month to get your bank statement. You would have to, and I know some of us are, are doing bookkeeping for our jobs and for different things, so we still have to reconcile the records. You have to look at what you have spent and what the account says in order for those things to match up. And what God has done as he's looked at the record of Christ and he's looked at our record and in order for our record to match Christ so that our sins would not be counted against us, we made an exchange. God is the great heavenly exchequer, and he made the exchange. Covenant makers. So we're going all the way back to the New to Old Testament so that I can show you and demonstrate to you the fact that this silver thread of redemption has been running throughout eternity. Covenant makers would often exchange clothing with one another. So the exchange of robes symbolizes the putting on of each other and becoming one which is why the New Testament says to put off the old and to put on the new, because it's talking about walking and living in the new covenant, because in the Old Testament, covenant makers and people would make agreements between each other, and to symbolize the exchange that took place, they would exchange robes, symbolizing the putting on of each other and becoming one. It says that I give you all, by doing this, it says that I give you all that I have and you give me all that you are. I give you all my assets and I take all your liabilities. That's what Christ has done for us. He gave us all of his assets, his benefits, and he took on our liabilities, which are our sins. The exchange of belts, which was part of the armor, symbolized one party taking on the other's weakness in exchange for strength, which is why we are supposed to put on the belt of truth. Bless you, Lord God. So what are we supposed to do with this information? We're supposed to make the exchange. Since Christ 
change places with us. We must make we must make the exchange complete. Some of us haven't made a decision to make this exchange complete. We are still holding on to some things. We are still holding on to some sins. We are still lying to ourselves and lying to ourselves with believing wrong things and having wrong ways of thinking. And we have not exchanged our mind for the mind of Christ. Bless you, Lord God. We have to complete the transaction. I implore you today to complete the transaction because we have a job to do. And that job is to become ambassadors for Christ so that we can share this message with other people. We have to allow Christ to redeem us. You have to allow Christ to redeem you. Make the transaction complete. It's like walking into a store and exchanging something worthless for something priceless. Be free from the yoke of bondage of sin and be yoked up with Christ. And because we are all at different levels of our walk and our salvation, we all have to take inventory of whatever those things are that we are still holding on to, that we are still uh, uh, refraining from allowing God to take from us in exchange for our redemption and reconciliation. Redemption is deliverance by payment of a price. It means to buy back in the marketplace or to buy out from the marketplace, to remove from sale. Some of us are still sitting on a shelf somewhere with a price tag on us that we can't nobody afford to pay but God, but Jesus Christ, because that price tag is our sins. It's the price. It says the wages of sin is death. You don't have enough to be able to come to God and bargain in the flea market of life and ask God to exchange and remove your sins. We have to allow Christ, who has paid the price once and for all, to do that for us. Mm. Christ paid the debt or the price for our sin. He removed us from the slavery of sin, freed us and bought us back. The record of debt has been paid and the charges against us have been removed. Thus we have been redeemed or set free because Christ's blood served as a ransom. We need to repent while we still have time and we need to work and be his ambassadors of reconciliation while it is still day. For when the night comes, no man will be able to work. This is a message that we know as believers, but how seriously have we taken up the charge to do just what he has asked us to do? Or how many of us have been so bogged down in our own weights and our own sin that we don't even have the ability or the proper witness or credibility with those in our own household to be able to tell them about the reconciliation or the fact that Jesus has paid the price and bought us back. Right now in this season, while we still have time, God is saying to the household of faith first, be reconciled. Come back to me and I will come back to you. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you're at in your life, or where you've been, even if it was just this morning that you sinned, you fell short. Jesus is saying, God is saying, through that silver thread of redemption, the message has always been the same. He laid it before the foundation of the world. He wants and desires to have a relationship with us and for us to be right with him. That is all he's ever asked for. That is what the entire Old and New Testament is about, the story of this silver thread of redemption. We need to repent while we still have time. The invitation is open to repent, and repent means to turn to God from our sins. Turn back to God with your whole heart. Second Chronicles 7, 13 through 15. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls, or command grasshoppers to devour your crops, or send plagues among you. That is the how of the plague. So in other words, God is saying here, we have a new understanding of this script, these scriptures, and we see that the message has been throughout all of these scriptures that we have quoted and recited. We can see it in the proper context, in the proper light. He's saying sometimes when you fall short, I'm going to send a strike against you. I'm going to inflict something on you so that you can suffer 
so that you will be inclined to return to me. And so how does he do that? Through plagues, the various methods, droughts, grasshoppers. Right now, we know that there's a, uh, a locust plague that has moved from Africa to the Middle East, as they call it, over into India now, these locust plagues. So there, is, there are multiple strikes and judgments against the world. That is why I said that we need to see what is happening because this is worldwide, amen? These various methods where God uses to get our attention. Bless you, Lord God. Or send plagues among you, verse 14. But then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, surrender, yield, stop trying to do things your way, stop trying to have it your way, stop seeing things through your lens. If you would humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, if you would humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, humble themselves, pray, seek his face and turn from his wicked way, their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and my ears be attentive. Remember in Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16, I believe it was the final verse. It says, let me go back to it. It says, when you bring this silver ransom, the silver coin as a ransom, it says it will bring the Israelites, the Lord, it, it will bring the Israelites to the Lord's attention and it will purify your lives. When they brought the silver coin, it got God's attention. And he says that when you do these things, humble yourself, seek, pray, and turn, my ears will be open and my eyes will be open and my ears will be attentive to every prayer made in this place. When we repent, when we bring before God the sacrifice upon us, that Christ has made, it gets God's attention. You have been screaming, you have been yelling, you have been doing all kinds of things, you may have even been cutting yourself or whatever it is in an attempt to get somebody's attention, but really you're really just trying to get God's attention. You may not even realize that this is what you're doing. You may have been drinking, you may have been smoking weed, you may have been having sex, but what you're really trying to do is get somebody's attention. You're crying out, your sins are causing you to cry out, but those are the things that get God's attention. He says that if you humble yourself, if you pray, if you seek his face, and then turn from your wicked ways, when you bring that offering, that free gift of salvation, and it is upon you, God says, then I will be attentive. Then my eyes will be open and attentive unto you. The Lord's prayer demonstrates that we are to pray for our nation's leaders. But this along with other scriptures demonstrates that we are to call our leaders to repentance as well. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, a lying witness who gives false testimony, and one who stirs up trouble among brothers. Our nation may have been founded on God-like principles, but indeed, it has been ruled by the things that God hates. So on the one hand, they're saying, we are a nation that has founded our principles on God, but at the same time, they were founding this nation on the things that God hates, arrogance, thinking that I'm better than somebody else, that black people have a, a permanent inferior status. That's arrogance, a lying tongue. Oh God, we can go on and on and talk about the lying tongue and we know that there are many politicians and leaders who have a lying tongue and they've been lying for time immemorial. Hands that shed innocent blood. There's been so much blood that has been spilt on this soil. 
in the name of the manifest destiny, in the name of imperialism and colonialism, in the name of establishing a more perfect union, blood was shed and spilt from innocent people in order for this nation to be founded and established. And I know I've taken a turn. I want y'all to go in and turn with me. We're talking about being ambassadors. We're talking about first getting ourselves right so that we can become his ambassadors. But you can't be an ambassador and you can't cry out the clarion, send out the clarion call if in your own life you are still struggling with personal sin. God is calling us to be elevated to a place that is higher, that he can use us because he was making his appeal through us now. First, God was in Christ saying to people, come back to me. He was reconciling the world through himself. But now he's saying that he's making his appeal through us. But you can't do that if your witness is raggedy. If people see you acting like the world and acting like a sinner and cursing out your own family members in your house, he's not going to be able to use you. But what he's trying to do is get us in a position, saints of God, so that we can send out the clarion call to return. Tell our brothers and sisters, our family members, our distant relatives, it's time to return. It's time to come back to God. It's not time to make America great again. It's time to repent. It's time to turn from our sins and from our wicked ways. America has never been great according to the standards of God. Because while we have had God-like principles, and I say God with a small g, God-like principles, in fact, and indeed, our nation has been founded on the things that God hates. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that plots wicked schemes. Feet eager to run to evil. A lying witness who gives false testimony. I was in D.C. the day that the Mueller report came out. And one who stirs up trouble among the brothers. Right now, we have people talking about a race war. People that are talking about fighting and killing one another. Over what? to make America great again. Our nation may have been founded on paper with God-like principles, but indeed it has been ruled by the things that God hates. This message is one that is at a different elevation. It's not a message necessarily to make you feel good, although it has made me feel good, because when I think about the silver thread of redemption and how the God has had a plan for the begin from the beginning of time so that I could come back to him and be made right with him. If we could only grasp that concept, uh, concept if we could only understand that it has been God's desire all the time for us to walk in fellowship with him. That brings me to tears, that brings me comfort. That lets me know how much God loves us. We have been fighting with God our entire existence. Humankind has been fighting with God because we believe like the devil that we know better and that we are better. That we can choose our own destiny. We can choose our own path. That is what Satan offered Adam and Eve in the garden. He offered them knowledge to become like God, to be able to choose for yourself and know somehow better than God who created everything. And from then on, God has been saying, come back to me. Come back to me. So this message is not one that is supposed to make you shout and make you feel good. This is a call to action. This is a prophetic word that when we look out at the landscape of what's happening in the world today, we are in a season right now where we are in a period of being struck. The world is being struck. We are experiencing plagues of various kinds because there is a judgment against the world. Jesus described it as the first of the birth pains. Do I believe that we have entered into the end times? Not just yet. There's a distinction between the last days, which existed between the, the, the time of Christ's birth, and it will, it will culminate up until the return of Christ, right before the Antichrist, or right before the world system is established and the Antichrist is revealed, then we will be entering the end times with the great falling away. I have a video about that. If you're interested, check it out.
it's on the website. But we are in a season now where we're seeing the beginning of birth pains with more to come. But Jesus said that when you see these things begin to happen, understand that there's more to come. So while we still have time, we may have another 100 years. We may have another 200 years. I don't know because Christ didn't give us an exact time. He said, you don't know when I'm going to return, but we can discern the times and the seasons. So this is an opportunity for you to become workers for God, that the invitation is open to you to be his mouthpiece. If you've never considered it before, now is the time for you to consider it. This, this uh, message of reconciliation. And not only that, but it's a time for the church, for the ecclesia, for the body of Christ, the called out ones, to finally make a decision. There's a scripture that says, how long will you halt between two opinions? It is time for us to make a decision. to choose Christ, to make the exchange complete, to not lean on our own understanding, to not draw from other ancient knowledge, but to know and to preach and teach the message of reconciliation through Christ. Because we are in that season where there's an urgent need for us to do just that, amen? So the message was the silver thread of redemption, I hope that you have taken heed to the things that have been said. Go back and listen to it again and again, because I know that there was a lot of scripture that I, I threw out at you guys, but I hope that through this message, I've demonstrated that what God has done, what God is doing, and what God is going to do is all about making us right with him, bringing us back to him that it has always his, been his desire to heal us, to deliver us, to redeem us, to walk in fellowship with us. There is healing right now that is going out in the earth and not just healing for your bodies, but healing for your souls, healing for your minds. It is time for us to take, an opp take this opportunity to walk in reconciliation, to be redeemed to completely make the exchange. I preached a message years ago, is your God a partial God? Where we put God in this category and our lives are in these different boxes and we want God over here, but we don't want God down here. We let God in the front door, but we don't let him all the way back inside the closet. We let God in certain parts of our house, our temple, but we don't let him walk freely in. It's time to let him walk freely in and exchange. Amen? Amen. So at this time, um, if there is uh, anybody that wants to comment or if you have a prayer request, we're going to close soon uh, and we're going to stop recording. So do I need to stop recording or are you going to stop recording? Okay. So while Alex is uh, going to stop the recording in just a moment, Amen.